Well, as I said, we are studying, uh, doing a series now. This is week number, what week is this? Number three in the uh, series called Jesus the Healer. And we are taking the uh, healing testimonies of Jesus one by one, going through them and looking them over. Tonight, we want you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 8. And we're going to look beginning in verse 5. We're going to start this. Last week we looked at the, uh, the uh, leper that he healed in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Tonight we're going to look at this next one, which is the healing of the servant of the Roman centurion. I have uh, particularly taught on this one over the years, and many of you have heard many of the things that I've shared on this, but I've been looking at this, I've been approaching these things from a fresh standpoint rather than just preaching, teaching what I've taught before. I've been going to the Word and asking the Lord, now Lord, show me, show me something uh, to add to. Not, to. not to take the place of, because it's all good, but just Lord, give me something, something fresh here, something, something that I hadn't seen before, because I know the Word of God is inexhaustible. And as I've gone back to these things, more and more I've seen specific aspects and fresh insights that perhaps we haven't gone over before. So this series is going to be a fresh series, glory to God, not a repeat, though a re nothing wrong with a repeat, Amen. nothing wrong with, with sharing something more than once. But I learned years ago, I've been pastoring over 40 years now, and I learned early on that one challenge that a pastor has that maybe some of the other offices don't have is that a pastor has to learn to say the same thing a hundred different ways because you just can't keep teaching the same message every week. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta present the same truth. Truth doesn't change, but you gotta let the Lord show you different ways to package it. And of course, that's, that's something that the teacher does. And then as a, a pastor, you have, to, you have to either teach or provide teaching for the people. Teaching is what causes us to grow. So I learned a long time ago to let the Lord show me different ways to say the same things. Tonight, we're going to start reading here in chapter 8 of the book of Matthew, verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, saying, or beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Glory to God. What a beautiful truth. Now then, you can turn with me in your Bibles over to the Gospel of Luke because Luke also records this same testimony, but each one of them share different aspects of it. We'll take these two and we'll put them together. Luke chapter 7, verse 1. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. And when Jesus went with them, or then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, 
And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about and said to the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. And so we see, we put these two passages together, and we see a much bigger picture, and we draw from both of these tonight as we go into this teaching. Now understand this, there's no way that you can exhaust everything that's in this this, uh, uh, healing testimony in one service. We're taking one service, uh, generally generally speaking, and, and applying it, or taking one service and teaching each one of these healing testimonies. But that doesn't mean we've got all there is in it. Like I say, I've taught for hours on this. Some things I've repeated, some things I've added to. Tonight, I just want to share with you some high spots and some important spots and come at this a little bit different, uh, differently than perhaps uh, we've talked about it before. We see in both passages, we know this is the same story, even though that there are differences in it, because both of these took place in Capernaum, early in Jesus' ministry in the Galilean region. There were both uh, we, both, we see that both of these refer to the servant of a centurion who besought Jesus. And of course, the same man is the one that Jesus declared, I haven't seen faith like this. No, not in all of Israel. Now, Capernaum, just as a little nugget of truth here, nugget of information, is the word uh, in the Hebrew would, or in the Greek, it would be pronounced a little bit closer to Kafar Nahum. Kafar Nahum. And actually what that means is the village, village of Nahum. Nahum was an Old Testament prophet. Capernaum was his home, was his hometown, you might say. Now a centurion, as it's listed here, that's another interesting thing. I looked at some things that I hadn't noticed before. A centurion, first of all, was a captain. He was uh, the equivalent of a, a captain, a field grade officer in uh, our U.S. military. He had the oversight of, or had the authority over, 80 or 100 soldiers under him. Some say 80, some say 100. Doesn't really matter. It's a pretty good number either way. But we see here that he had command over approximately 100 soldiers. And uh, it surprised me as I got to looking at this today, and uh, up, you know, up to today as I put it all together, that Roman centurions are actually spoken pretty well of in the New Testament. Now, on the ground in Israel at the time, there was an animosity between the Jews and the Romans. And rightly so. The Romans were the conquering nation. The Jews were the conquered nation. They were absorbed into the Roman Empire. They, Rome was a little bit different than some of the other um, kingdoms and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, civilizations, I guess you'd say that uh, preceded them in that Rome allowed people to keep their culture and they allowed them a certain amount of self-government. In other words, they didn't just demand that they conform to, you you didn't see, uh, you know, Rome demanded that they bow down to their idols like Nebuchadnezzar did, for instance. And so they allowed them some autonomy and some self-government and certainly allowed them to hang on to their their system of worship. But uh, the... uh, the Jews were, had, had a great animosity toward Rome in general, and certainly toward those that were in leadership of Rome. And then, of course, a Roman centurion would be a man of, uh, well, he'd be a man of some wealth. He'd be a man of great authority. He'd be someone of great prestige. He'd be the guy that people would step aside for when he walked down the road. And so he, thereby, would have looked down in the average sense, on the Roman people. I mean, sorry, on the Jewish people, you know, because the Roman culture and the Jewish culture, two entirely different things. But this Roman centurion was a little bit different. But overall, in the New Testament, you find centurions well spoken of. Uh, For instance, um, it was a centurion that saw Jesus, that beheld Jesus on the the cross and said, uh, surely this man was the son of God. Uh, we find interaction between Paul and Roman centurions. And in each case, it was not in any way uh, oppressive the way that the Roman centurions reacted to or treated him. So we see some things here about that that uh, kind of uh, 
give us a little bit of insight, and, and especially into this Roman centurion. And the more I think about it, and the more I examine it, the more I think that the Holy Ghost may be showing us something here in this Roman centurion. In other words, this, 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 this guy may well be a prototype of a New Testament believer and an example of what God looks for in New Testament faith. And the reason I say that is I'll explain it to you. Now, one of the things that he said is that he hadn't seen faith like this in all of Israel. That opens up something interesting to me. Does the faith of the church look like the faith of Israel? Perhaps not. Perhaps it's not supposed to. Jesus said, he marveled at it, as a matter of fact, over in Luke's, Luke's account of it, he marveled at it. And the only other thing that we, see is Jesus, that, see, that we see Jesus marveling at is the unbelief of the Jewish people. For instance, in, in Mark's gospel, the fifth chapter, where he could there do no mighty work, and he marveled because of their unbelief. But here Jesus is marveling at faith. Why wouldn't Jesus marvel at the faith of some of the Israelites? We don't find him commending that. But he, what he said here was, he didn't say, I haven't seen faith in Israel. He said, I haven't seen this kind of faith. I haven't seen so great faith. No, not in Israel. Well, Jesus said another interesting thing in Matthew's account when he said, uh, I've not found so great faith in Israel, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit Sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the, king, in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus said something else there that's kind of a clue to us. Now hold your place here, and also in Luke chapter 7. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 2 real quickly. And notice the way that Paul frames this up in, um, in the book of Ephesians. Keep in mind that the book of, the, of Ephesians is considered by many including me, as the Holy of Holies of the New Testament. In the book of Ephesians, and you know I've told you this before, God's favorite Old Testament scripture is found in Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. The reason I say it's God's favorite scripture is because it's quoted more in the New Testament than any other Old Testament scripture. Jesus quoted it. Paul quoted it. Peter quoted it. Peter preached it on the day of Pentecost. But the book of Ephesians enlarges it and expands it and gives us the fullness of what that means when it tells us in Ephesians 1 that he's raised Jesus up, set, it his own, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all else that has been created. And you has he raised with him. You've been quickened with him. You've been raised up together with him in chapter 2. It goes on to say, and you've been seated together in heavenly places in Christ. Well, that is the thrust of Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's why I say that Ephesians is such an important truth in the Bible. Now that's not to minimize anything else. It's just that Ephesians is one of my favorite books to study. I like the study of Ephesians. But now look in chapter 2. After he explains to the church that we've been raised up and seated together with Christ, let's pick it up in verse 11. Wherefore remember, I'm in Ephesians 2, 11. Wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In other words, you're called by the Jews the uncircumcision. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was the Gentile world. They had no hope. They were without God. They had no access to God. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you that were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Notice that. By him we both Both who? The circumcision made by hands and the uncircumcision. Now therefore we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit." So what that verse of Scripture tells us, and what that passage of Scripture tells us, is exactly what we see here in, the, in this uh, episode with the Roman centurion. He was outside the covenant, just like the woman in Matthew chapter 15, the Syrophoenician woman. Remember when she came to Jesus and she said, Lord have mercy on me, and Jesus wouldn't even answer her. Didn't say a word. She kept on, she kept pressing. The disciples said, send her away. Jesus explained to her, I'm not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He explained to her, that, that's not my assignment. My assignment is not the Samaritan world. It's not the Gentile world at this time. Now, he didn't go into all that explanation. He was going to take care of that part of it. But so far in that level or that stage of his ministry, he, he, he had no assignment to her. And he couldn't go beyond that on his initiative, because he only did what he was led to do by the Spirit of God, what the Father said to him, what the Father showed him. So he didn't have the option, if you will, of just saying, you know, I'm God, I'll do it for you just because I want to. He had to follow his assignment. He had, to be, he had to be faithful and fulfill what God had sent him to do. But that woman with her faith now reached in and pulled something out that was not yet available to the world. It would have been, or it became available to the world in a short period of time after that, but at that moment, her faith, you might say her faith transcended time and reached into the future and pulled something out, pulled, pulled, pulled a, a covenant benefit out of a covenant that hadn't even been established yet because the blood of Jesus hadn't been shed. Now here's a Roman centurion doing a very, very similar thing. But it, he doesn't go about it exactly the same way. Actually, he does go about it the same way, but there are different aspects to this that we don't see in that woman's testimony. And so Jesus said in verse 10, 11, and 12, he said, this faith that I'm seeing I haven't found in Israel, and this is the faith that's going to cause many to come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob and dine at that table with them. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, the 23rd Psalm says, which is the Psalm we're living in today. And one of the benefits of that is he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And we belly up to that table and we partake of God's blessings and God's provision in the presence of our enemies, meaning in this fallen world, Amen. meaning in this, in, this, in this season that we're in. Not talking about heaven. Amen. Heaven's chapter 24 of the book of Psalms. Psalm 23 is now. Amen. God prepares this table in the presence of our enemies and even so our cup runs over. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. This centurion before any of us did, got over here into this covenant and partook of the blessings of God. And Jesus said, that's what's going to be happening. I believe that's what Jesus was explaining in chapter 11 and 12, that the kind of faith that the Roman centurion is displaying was the kind of faith that was going to be displayed in the new covenant and that was going to cause people like you and me who had no covenant and had no access to God, but now through the blood of Jesus, the partition is down, we can come in with that same kind of faith. Now, if it's faith that causes you to sit down at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob 
then that would be what would we what we would uh, uh, you know traditionally and customarily call saving faith. Saving faith, faith to get saved, faith to receive new life, faith to receive the new birth. Do you see what I'm saying? All right. Now, if that is the faith that this Roman centurion displayed, saving faith, and every single one of you is saved, and every single one of you has received eternal life, then you have already exhibited the kind of faith that it took to get this man's prayer answered. Amen. Amen. If you've got the faith to be saved in the traditional customary sense, then you've got all you need to receive the, the healing benefits of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that blesses me. It's not like I, gotta, I get saved and then I got to figure out how to have enough faith to get something else. If I've got the faith to receive new life, I got the faith I need to overcome in this life. I got the faith that I need. If I got the faith, if I, if I have the kind of faith, Jesus didn't see this kind of faith in Israel. If I have the kind of faith that he marvels at, that'll transform me from a dead creature into a new creature in the image of Christ Jesus. If I can become a new creature, then praise the Lord, I can get a new kidney. Amen. Yes. If I can become a new creature, I can get a new liver. Amen. If, I can, if I got the faith that I need to become a new creature, then I can get, glory to God, a new heart. If I've got the faith that I need to become a new creature, then I can get a new pancreas. Amen. Amen. Are y'all listening to me? Yes. That's why I say this Roman centurion, I believe, is a prototype of a New Testament believer. What God wants us to look like as New Testament believers. Now here's some other things that we see. His faith. This faith that Jesus never saw in Israel. Some characteristics of this faith. And some attitudes that we see in this prototype, if you will, in this Roman centurion. First of all, we see in both cases the emphasis on authority. An understanding of authority. Now that's the obvious thing here to me. That's the first thing that stands out to me. That's the first thing I learned out of this passage of Scripture. Is understanding authority. And we could do a series on that. So obviously we can't do it all tonight. Matter of fact, I have done series on the authority of the believer. But the important thing that I want you to see tonight is it is fundamental, it is necessary to have a, to have a foundational understanding of how authority works. Now this Roman centurion explains some things. We understand that by definition authority is delegated power. Somebody somewhere has power. Somebody somewhere has the say-so. Somebody somewhere the buck stops there. Are you here? Ultimately, of course, God is the ultimate power. But we bring that down and break, and we break that down into some localized understanding. If you have a business and you're the CEO of that business, then the buck stops with you as far as that business is concerned. You have authority, but at the same time, that, that authority can be delegated. You have the power. You've got the power of the checkbook. You've got the power of, the, of hiring and firing and all that. But that authority can be delegated. You can hire others and delegate portions of that, of that power to them. And you can put someone in charge of human resources and they can start doing the hiring and firing or at least aiding in it. You can put somebody else in charge of the accounting uh, department and they can have the power of the checkbook. They can sign your name because you have delegated that authority. You see that? Yes. In a family, the same thing is true. The parents, in, the, in God's divine order, the father is the leader, the spiritual leader, and the uh, overall leader of the, of the family. He is the head of the wife. The wife submits to him. The wife is over the house. They both together are over the children. They can make decisions for the children. Even though the children are their own people, there is a season there 
where you've got authority over your children. Now, another thing about authority is not only can it be delegated, but along with authority comes responsibility. I like to compare it to the, rail, to the, uh, the rails of a, of a train, you know, the railroad tracks of a train, that those, the, 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 you've got two rails and they always run parallel. They never converge, they never diverge. If that happens, there's a train wreck. So these rails run parallel. They may go around curves, they may go up grades, they may go through tunnels, but they never cease running parallel. Authority and responsibility will, will always parallel one another. What you've got authority over, you're responsible for it. Amen. What you are responsible for, in order for it to work properly, you've got to have authority over it. You've got to have the say-so in a matter if you're going to be responsible. If somebody's going to hold you responsible, but they don't give you the authority, then that's an injustice. It's something that you cannot enforce. Now this Roman centurion explained that. He said, I am a man under authority. The very next words he said, in effect, I have authority. He said, I, I, have, I am a man set under authority, and I say to my servant, I say to this one, I say to that one, they do what I say. But notice, the say-so here comes from above. It doesn't come from him. Our authority does not come from us. We walk around and say, well, you know, I got the believer's authority. Yes, you do, because it's been delegated to you. It's been conferred upon you. You don't have authority of your own. You've got the authority of Jesus. That's why when we speak, we speak in the name of Scott, of Joe, of Wade. No, of Jesus. That's where the authority lies. And Jesus has conferred his authority upon his people. So, very important to understand, if you're going to have authority, you've got to be under authority. To have authority, you have to have received authority. And that's what the Bible tells us that we as New Testament believers have. Jesus has been given a name which is above every name. And at that name, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. And then what does it say? That name belongs to the church. We speak, we preach, we act, we do in the name of Jesus. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And these signs will follow them that believe. When you're preaching the gospel, you're not preaching your own ideas. Amen. You're not preaching your own doctrine. You're not preaching your own uh, concepts. You are preaching what God has given you to preach. And in that, you've got His authority in it because it's got His power in it. Amen. You see that? Important to understand how authority works. Now that's just a little taste of it, but that's as far as we'll go tonight. We've got to move on. The second thing we see in this Roman centurion, and really all of these things kind of work together, and I'm just taking, taking them apart to examine them a little bit. But notice what it says. Notice how, how the, uh, well, the second thing that you want to write down here as far as an ingredient that we see in this as a prototype of a New Testament believer is, first of all, authority and an understanding of it, Secondly, humility. Notice the humility of this man. Now again, a Roman centurion of that day, ruling over a conquered people, i.e. Israel, and the Jews, even though they still had their own culture and they, they were allowed to worship as they wanted to worship and they were allowed to do certain things, yet still they had to answer to Rome. Because even when it came to crucifying Jesus, they could not do that on their own. They had to take him before Pilate. They had to have Rome's permission. They had to have Rome's approval. And ultimately, Rome had to be the one that executed him. They could not do it on their own. And so, here's a Roman centurion who stands at a very high position of authority in the Roman government. And uh, here is a Jewish rabbi... Jesus, but notice how he approaches him. He said in both cases, both Matthew 8 and Luke chapter 7, 
I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Chapter 7, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Luke reports almost the same thing, almost word for word. That was not the usual attitude of a high-ranking Roman soldier. And yet, and yet it was him. Yet here was a man who had authority, he was under authority, and he had authority, but when it came to the things of God, he was very humble. I am not worthy. That's an amazing statement when you start to think about it. Yeah. I'm not worthy. This is an attitude that we should never lose. Just like it said there in the second chapter of Ephesians. Remember, he said, that at one time you were on the outside looking in. It's the blood of Jesus. Our humility should not be one of, I am not worthy because of the blood. Our attitude should be, if it wasn't for the blood, I'd be nothing. If it wasn't for the blood, I'd be a zero with the line erased, with the circle erased. I'd be nothing. That's a good attitude to remember. That keeps you from making mistakes by trying to do things yourself. Keeps you on track following the Holy Ghost. I think that's an astounding thing in the light of this man's position in Rome because here he was dealing with a conquered people, exercising authority over a conquered people. And at the same time, his attitude toward this man was, I'm not worthy to even have you in my home. So you see, you can be a man of authority and you can be a man of power and you can be a person of great determination and fierceness even when it comes to the devil, but still maintain a proper attitude toward God and the things of God. Amen. The Bible tells us that every, man, that, that every man should think, that we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's why God puts such a premium on faith, because it takes you out of it, and it puts Him in it instead. It gives Him the opportunity to do for you, but in order for Him to do for you, you've got to quit trying to do it yourself. Amen. That is, quit trying to control how He does it. Amen. Are you listening to me? So the second thing we see there is an attitude of humility. The third thing we see is very closely associated there, and that is honor. He had an, an astounding honor for a Roman, you stop and think about it, for the Word of God and the God of Israel. He had an honor for the people of God. The Bible says in the seventh chapter of Luke, and here again we see the authority at work, and this is the reason that it's worded different. In Matthew chapter 8 it said, he, uh, the, the centurion, went to Jesus and, and said, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy. Now Luke's gospel said that he was dying, ready to die. This was a very serious thing. So Matthew chapter 8 said, the centurion went to him beseeching him. There came a centurion beseeching him. But then Luke's gospel enlarges that a little bit and said, it wasn't the man himself it was a delegation that he had asked to go to Jesus in his place. And this delegation consisted of um, um, the elders, verse 3, he sent unto them the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. So here again we see the understanding and the principle of authority that when you send somebody, it's no different than when you go yourself. 
because the centurion gave this delegation the words, the request, the petition to put before Jesus. So the Bible, the Holy Ghost counts it like the man did it himself. Delegation, authority. Then in Luke's account, when they came to Jesus, they went, um, yeah, when they came to Jesus, they went to bat for this centurion and said, he's worthy for whom he should do this, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Now, I've never been to, well, actually, I have been to the city of Capernaum. But what I'm thinking of are pictures that I've seen. I've seen it, but I, I don't really remember it that much. But that synagogue is still there in the city of Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And this Roman centurion built it for him. Now, it's interesting to note here to me that he had this, 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 this synagogue that was built. It wasn't just, you know, a blow up synagogue. This thing was built out of, you know, stone and, you know, it took a while to do this. In other words, this thing was built before Jesus ever appeared on the scene and it was built before his servant ever got sick. And so the love that was shown there was genuine. Yeah. It wasn't a love to get something from somebody because he had nothing he needed to get at the time. But he built the synagogue because he loved the God of Israel and he loved the people of the God of Israel and he had a profound respect for the Word of God. Because his answer where Jesus was concerned, when he saw Jesus coming, he sent out more friends. Once again, Luke's gospel indicates that the man himself never even spoke directly to Jesus. Maybe he did. Maybe he went out with the friends. I don't know. But the point is, he sent out more friends, and they said to him, you don't have to come. You don't have to, you don't have to expend your energy and take your time to come. I understand how authority works. If I tell a servant to do it, he's going to do it I, because I have authority over him. And I see in you, you have authority over the devil and over sickness. Just say in a word, and my servant will be healed. And that's when Jesus spoke up and said, this is, this is marvelous. This is the kind of faith that I haven't seen in Israel. And then, of course, the fourth thing that we see, third, third thing was honor. The fourth thing that we see here is a compassion and a love in him. A compassion for God's people, a compassion for his servant. He obviously, you know, even though the man was a servant, you know, an employee at best, a forced servitude at worst. The point is, he was a man who cared about those that he lived around and that lived around him and that those that, were, that he was responsible for. He was responsible perhaps to some extent for the governing of the people of God there, the governing of Israel. He was responsible for this servant. There was a love and a compassion in him. This is why I say that the Roman centurion may well be a Holy Ghost prototype for the believer. These are the things that we should develop ourselves in. See? Now keep in mind the Roman centurion wasn't asking for himself. He didn't need healing. He's not the one that got healing. Amen. But he interceded on behalf of somebody else. Once again, love and compassion and an attitude of wanting to get help for others. This man acted as an intercessor by bringing, by bringing the power of God to the person. And we can do the same thing. So these are areas where I think all of us must develop ourselves and must establish ourselves. We need to have a grasp on authority. We need to remain humble. We must honor God and the people of God of all the covenants. That's the reason that we're so big on Israel around here. We love them because we know God loves them. 
and God's not through with them. Amen. And when I say big on Israel, what I mean more than anything else is I want as an American to have the kind of leadership that supports Israel in times of need and stands beside them in the face of their enemies. And sadly, we don't have that today. We don't have that at all. But we will. I said we will. Are you listening to me? So this man acted as an intercessor by bringing the power to the person. He went to Jesus to get the power for the need in the person. Now, finally, once again, we see in this story God's ability. Jesus' ability is not in question. Just like last week we talked about that uh, uh, leper. He said, if you will, you can. And Jesus instantly responded, I will. Same thing here with this Roman centurion. He didn't question his ability, but he sent people to Jesus, will you? Go, go intercede for, him, for me. Go, go, go talk to Jesus. I don't have a covenant with him, but you do. I'm sending you in my, in my stead. Go, go, go tell him. You're my friends. Go get him. And Jesus immediately responded, I'll go and heal him. Get settled on God is able. Get settled on God is able. He's able today. He's able tonight. He's able right now. He doesn't have to wait until the rooster crows again. He doesn't have to wait another revolution around the sun. He doesn't have to wait until an election. He doesn't have to wait. He's able to do what he said he would do, and he's able to fulfill every promise in you. What's he looking for? Faith. Faith. Everybody say faith. faith. Praise God. So that's the story for tonight of the Roman centurion. And I think he's got some good uh, attitudes and characteristics there that we can learn from. Amen. Amen. Glory to God.